My name is Michael Blend. Can everybody hear me okay? You guys good? All right. So I am like a hobby gardener. I have a greenhouse that I've built in my backyard, and it's still a work in progress. So this is uh, when we get to the question part, you can ask a lot of questions. <laughs> and I don't know if I'll know the answers, but between the three of us, because Joe's on the panel on the Patty, and Patty's really got a lot of experience. She's like a lifelong gardener. Um, but I really love just plants and flowers, and so we had a beautiful yard with all kinds of flowers and things in it. And this is my wife, Diana, and she sent me to a permaculture design course uh, five years ago, and it really changed the way I viewed everything. And um, so that kind of set off um, a bunch of events. Yeah, this is the yard before the greenhouse. And then we have a fish pond and a bunch of koi that swim around in there, and it's very peaceful. And then all of a sudden, I went to this convergence and heard this conference and learned about permaculture and decided I was going to build a greenhouse. And I wanted to do, I was a builder prior, so I, I wanted to do something that would hold as much heat as possible, so I submerged it into the ground and required a lot of gravel to come in. And it's like, oh, what have we done to the yard? Right? Oh my yeah, we brought in the equipment, we brought utilities down to the site, um, and we started doing compaction. Pace had a lot of good friends <laughs> and help. <laughs> the, um, um, I wanted to have a good foundation for this thing, and so we um, used a three inch minus gravel, because I use earth bags to do the, the the walls up to about three feet high and then there's glass on top you'll see that as we go through this and then polycarbonate on the roof so I use a filter of fabric that we put underneath the gravel you can kind of see it uh, going up the banks and there's the drain tile actually which is just a plastic pipe that's perforated that goes around the perimeter to keep any groundwater from uh, flooding it uh, this is all compacted and that's kind of a aerial shot um, as we're building it. The utilities are coming up right in the back there. Um, and we're checking the grade, make sure it's level. And I insulated underneath it and also all the way around the perimeter. You can see the <coughs> couple first courses of earth bags. They're just feed sacks that were misprinted. I got like a whole bunch of them for 300 bucks. Um, got a whole bunch left over if anybody needs some. <laughs> so, uh, as we, this is where it starts taking shape. And you can see we put a climate battery in underneath. So there's a uh, perforated pipe in through gravel. And I understand that you can also use just soil. You could do this with just soil. And you'll see that with um, Joe's, well, you use gravel too. But uh, you don't necessarily have to have drain rock. I just put the drain rock in because it seemed like you could thing to retain the heat. Also, I'm going to be doing aquaponics, and uh, so I'm not actually growing in the soil. So that's maybe a little different than a lot of people doing in their greenhouses. So in the back, this front area is the grow room where you see all the gravel, and then in the back, that's a seed starting area, and also where I have a fish tank for the aquaponics. And then this corner down here is a root cellar. And so that's actually a picture of the root cellar and that plywood arch top thing. Since I'm a builder, I was just trying a lot of different things. So earth bags were new to me. Um, I've done gravel foundations before, so that wasn't new. I've actually built houses on gravel foundations um, and, and, and domes too. But uh, with the earth bags, this uh, plywood door goes into a, a cool earth tube that's buried on the north side. So it's just um, a large diameter. It's about 30 inches in diameter, and it's about 30 feet long. And so the air comes into the root cellar through that earth tube. This, you'll see later, that has a door on it now with the uh, intake vent. And it, the root cellar stays very nice. A um, couple of gals that were helping me when they were cutting these gussets. And uh, 
it's just basically a piece of OSB with a wood nail to it. And then you can see right here on top, it's a rebar down in there. I don't know if you noticed the earlier shot, you have, like we put barbed wire between every course of earth bag and it keeps them from sliding sideways. And this is that gusset and there's 16 penny nails driven both directions through those. So <clears throat> we just put those in the bags periodically so that later we can attach things to the bags. So uh, this is kind of with all the bags in place and forming up for a bond beam that's a concrete beam that went around the top of the bags. Remember there's rebar that goes vertically through it and then those rebar are tied into this bond beam that has rebar in it. Um, and we're pouring concrete there and onto the, so this is the first concrete really that we're using because all the bags are filled with the soil that came out of the hole that we dug for the thing. And that's Joe, he's finishing off the bond beam. And it was good to have help when you're pouring concrete, that's for sure. Um, this is framing in the top. And we put polycarbonate on the roof. And it's uh, not clear, but it, it diffuses the light as it comes through. It's a triple wall polycarbonate. And I actually have recycled windows that I put in um, around the outside. And then I use these pallets to kind of terrace up over the back rooms because uh, I wanted to have like an earth berm thing but part of the thing was it's a, it's a little if I had this to do over and I was starting from scratch like looking for land I would have picked a different piece of land to be honest with you. <laughs> but we already lived here and we liked living there and I wasn't going to move and so we picked the sunniest spot in the yard and we did this thing you know made the best of what we had um, so <coughs> As Walter helped him, he put the the uh, get the roof ready for the polycarbonate, and we put that on. And I really wanted something permanent. And also, I was dealing with uh, owners' association. I had to get a, approval from them to build, and temporary structures aren't allowed. Hoop House wouldn't have been approved. Um, it's it amazing that they approved this, but <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. I gave them tomato plants. No, after. <laughs> Uh, and then in the back rooms, we used some of the logs that came off. I had to take some pine trees out in order to use. And, and then I spray foamed the underside in the back rooms just to, uh, because you don't want the warm, moist air to go through and then rot out your roof. On the top of that, there's actually airways that go through. So I vented the roof and then we put a pond liner on top and there's soil on the roof of this. And these are the two rooms. This is the seed starting room and also the root cellar. And those are the terraces on the north side. And it's another shot. So it's, on the inside we plastered the wall. So it took three coats of plaster. And I did two, like a, a rough coat that just filled in the seams of the bags and then another coat that pretty much covered the whole surface of the bags. And then this is a finished coat which is white. And I wanted to do it white to reflect light and just to lighten the whole space up, otherwise it's like a cave. And Emily, she's really helped with plastering. So this is where all the gravel was in that first shot. So you can see it's starting to take shape finally. <laughs> uh, so it's kind of been a long process. Uh, I built this little addition on the side already for, and I put a rocket mass heater in there because with the aquaponics you have to keep the water warm enough and for the plants too, actually, to do anything in the winter time as it gets colder, the water temperature. That I'm using koi and they hibernate at 50 degrees, so uh, I gotta stay warmer than 50 degrees. These are some tomatoes that I had like a couple years ago. And these are the morel mushrooms. We brought in wood chips and put in all the aisleways of the garden outside, and all these morels were coming up. Uh, this is just a shot in the summer and uh, a lot of squash and some raspberries and different things. So it's some beets. That's what happens when you send somebody to a permaculture conference. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is the rocket mass heater. And how many people are familiar with rocket mass heaters? A lot of people. So uh, I, and this was the second try, I would actually, change things on this one too. Um, they can be a little finicky. But 
I wanted to, the first one I did was a J tube, which is you stick sticks in it and it's got a little feeder inlet and you really have to be there all the time to be adding wood to the thing. And I realized right away that I was not gonna be there that much in the greenhouse. I wanted something where I could just light the fire and let it go and let it burn out and then it would heat some mass which would store the heat in the thermal mass. I went to a, a conference in Missoula on rocket mass heaters and the guy that was there was doing a, wet, a rocket mass heater for wet locations and he used this what he called a Pringles can because it kind of looks like that. But it's just a bunch of barrels stuck together and then um, and I sealed them all with uh, fire caulking. There's a copper pipe there and that, that's actually a preheater for some, some of the water. So I'm heating the water and the masonry inside the greenhouse and that's a um, shot inside the tubes. You feed the logs in the bottom and then the, the fire's coming up, or the, the exhaust is coming up through that square tube, which is all lined with fire bricks. And then it goes down through the other one into one end of the Pringles can and then out of the other end of the Pringles can it comes back up and then it goes out through the exhaust. And the exhaust is preheated because it's going through this hot area in the top of the barrel. And so that it would draft. It didn't draft right when I would start the fire or when I would open the doors to add logs because it's got this long, arduous path to go through before it goes out the top. And so my solution was I put a little fan on that exit, on that pipe so that when I start the fire, I turn the fan on low and it creates enough draft that I can start it without smoking myself out. And, or when I'm adding wood, I would turn the fan on low. Once it's hot, it runs fine. But, and then the, I had gone to ABC Acres, which is down in Hamilton, to look at his rocket mass here because he had done one with this batch box. And it worked great and everything, and they had given me the plans for the batch box. But what I didn't realize is there's a bypass in their system. It, it bypasses that whole loop when you're, and I should have put that bypass. So next year I'll probably open this up again. So basically it's a door right here in this pipe that allows it to come right out of there into this pipe and out the roof. And you can open that when you're starting or changing uh, and adding logs. And that bypass was a little key. So there's all these little things, you know, that if you don't get it just right, um, you get screwed up. So these are my troughs that I did. I'm doing a floating raft system for the aquaponics and um, built a structure over the top of them because I need lights in the wintertime. To grow year round here, you really, there's not enough light, there's not enough heat, there's, you know, there's all these issues. It, depending on what you want to grow, you know, certain things are going to be fine uh, to, to grow. And uh, like I have mustard greens and kale, it's really doing well out there right now. Um, and actually, I have a, a lemon tree that's got little lemons on it. Um, but for the most part, things are, are, you know, you really have to change the climate a lot in order to, to, to grow. <coughs> this is where the fish are going to live, so that's in the back corner of that seed starting room. And that's the root cellar. <laughs> and it does, the, I put these barrels in for water catchment, so there's a gutter on the south side. And everything, when it, it, we haven't had any precipitation in a long time. But when it rains, uh, the water goes into these barrels and then the aquaponics is recirculating anyway uh, because it basically the fish are pooping in the water and then the plants are taking up all that nutrient, um, the nitrites and mm -hmm. nitrates, and they're cleaning up the water for the fish again. So then it, as it goes back into the fish tank, um, it's, it's clean again. So it's a, it's a closed loop system. You lose water to transpiration and evaporation, but um, this rainwater, it'll be topped off with rainwater. Um, and then if the rainwater runs out, it does, there's a float in here in the bottom so that it'll be filled up with well water if we run short of rainwater. So that's that root cellar door that had that arch top door. So there's a vent in there. And it, it stays perfect. It's like 39 degrees and 90% humidity all winter long. It's amazing. So that's that's been pretty cool. So that's it. So it's just created a peaceful place in my yard. I wanted something that was really permanent and that I um, I just enjoy it. You know, just to me is my hobby. So, all right.
You're up. I'm Patty Armbruster. I live in eastern Montana. I'm an agriculture educator, so I work on a in a school system with kids 7 through 12. And so I uh, work at the school. We decided, I decided, they have to have a greenhouse. Yeah. <laughs> in order to grow food. I'm not going to teach kids how to be in agriculture and not grow food, so we're going to grow food. Uh, the school already knew would not allow a greenhouse because of the energy cost. Right? And I've done research with all the other ag teachers in the state and say, hey, what's it, which energy cost of your greenhouse? The conversations would come to a stop. They're like, you don't want to know? And I'm like, no, I've got to know. I'm doing a business plan. And they're like, a what? And they're like, uh, don't have the conversation. And I'm like, no, we have to have the conversation. <laughs> Right? So some of them $1,000 a month. Oh Anyhow, I decided, well, I if you know me very much, I can't be stopped. So I'm like, <laughs> we're still going to grow. We're still going to put up a greenhouse. So I put up a passive solar with students. So it's not near as high tech or very fancy, but it does work. So I work with that one. I also work at the, or help, I really consult with the Sleeping Buffalo Greenhouse, it's a hot springs. And they was putting up a 96, a 30 by 96 greenhouse, which is a used greenhouse they bought. And they were already going in with it when they met me. And they were, they were ready to buy a whole truckload of uh, soil that had um, miracle Grow in it and start growing. And I'm like, stop, wait a minute, if you want me to help, we're not starting there. <laughs> so. We stopped doing that, and then we decided to use what resources they had on site, which was uh, cattails from the tailings from their water, the pools, and old cattle truck wash station. So and I might old, it had been used as a truck wash station for cattle pots for decades and decades. Mm -hmm. And it's been decades since they had used it, so that it was well, well decomposed. I said, we'll just blend those products together and you get all the electric guys to bring you wood chips and they brought semi loads of wood chips and we blended them together. It was um, in the fall, so we got some moisture from Mother Nature and compost it, piled the size of the room in the compost. And then we used that to, to put into the beds. So I'm gonna show you those two uh, greenhouses. Both of them have uh, a little bit different footprint and and different goals. I'm also going to show you this one. This one is only one that I've, I've went to and I've researched. I actually have not been a grower in one of these. But this is a in Alliance, Nebraska. Russ Finch, he is in his 90s probably now, designed this greenhouse. And it's a geothermal. So you can see the where the pipes are coming out of the ground, the controls for the pipes. So they, they put duct um, dishes out in the front lawns here. There's really a pretty big lawn. And then those pipes are bringing in the, the air from the earth into the greenhouse. He's only using a small fan for his energy bill. That's it. Um, to be able to pull this air, he's either pulling it or pushing. So it depends on if he needs to cool the air or if he's warming the air with the fan. Very, very simple. And I'm like, wow, this is pretty darn cool. It's dug in the ground. So they dug down in the ground, and it's just earthed. They didn't do anything fancy. They actually even just had um, metal siding all against the earthen wall. In my area, that wouldn't work because we have salts in our soil. But I'm sure that you could come up with something pretty reasonable to do that. These are off his website. It's uh, growing in the snow, is the website. And this is what he grows in there. And he's growing all kinds of tropical fruit and you name it, it's in there, you know, from grapes to raspberries to to figs, all kinds of stuff. Unbelievable. In Lyons, Nebraska, but he's selling them all over the world and they're putting them in Canada and Idaho. And I think from my research of doing the passive solar that if you're if you want to do it, you can do it. So they've done it highly successful. 
not that expensive to put in. I think about 20,000 when I did my research about four years ago, it was 20,000 to buy the materials. So the labor is going to be your, your digging and so. He's been growing in this one for 30 years. So every, everybody wonders, well, how am I going to prune the trees? There are trees in there. <laughs> it's like, it says that the, the sunlight in the, when they hit the ceiling prunes them. But he doesn't prune them. So he harvests them. Yeah. That's what I want to do. I have to do much work and harvest them. So the only thing coming into the greenhouse is some compost. Ask him about pests, and he's like, well, he says there's enough beneficials in there to deal with pests. He's not going to pest problems. And he gave me one of those lemons. It's a Myers lemon. This is the passive solar at the Hinsdale School. It's a lot smaller, of course. This is uh, approximately 24 long and 16 of our walking area. So it's really about 22 deep. But it's got water barrels on, on, on the north wall as a heat sink. I didn't bring a lot of construction pictures. I didn't have <coughs> any construction. I was just talking about footprints. So. <laughs> This one is passive solar, and it does. It's not even hardwired, so there's no lights in it or nothing. So it uh, doesn't have an energy bill. At a school that was worried about an energy bill, that's pretty darn good. We are only trying to extend the season, so we're not doing what Mike's doing and trying to grow long season throughout the winter. We let the plants stop when they stop. A lot of times, we'll have plants go all the way through Thanksgiving. So for school, that's good enough. Right. We're just trying to teach them how to grow food and to, and to actually eat the food. Oh, I'll, I guess I'll have to say in this picture because I have to bring others. But to, it's got an extreme slope on the south side. And this is the north side. And the south side is a, two degrees off of uh, due south. And so it's the sun, the school is right on the south side of it. The sun comes over the top of the school in the winter and the sun rays come through and hit this glazing wall. It's the same glazing wall Mike's using a triple wall poly, and it comes through there. And then the back whole north wall is lined with water barrels. And they're, they're sealed water barrels. They're not for water, they're just for a heat sink. And they're on a concrete, concrete slab. We dug down, it's got a four, four, well, probably five foot foundation on it. So it's built just like a house. Six inch wall, six inch foundation. And when we had it opened up as a pit, I'm like, let's put a, a water reservoir in there. So we sunk a cistern in there. So that cistern, we could pull water in from rainwater and pump it up and use it. But we most been using it for heat sink. So it's just another heat, heat sink where it's holding heat into the, inside the building. It's completely insulated and runs with a fan in the ceiling off of solar. That's what you see there on the north side solar fan so that's pulling hot air out when we get too hot it just stops when it's not in the winter we just plug up the hole so we're not chimneying out heat we uh, it's got kale growing in it right now that was planted last last summer sometime or last spring it's two minutes thank you this is a sleeping buffalo greenhouse the one of the hot springs was talking about. Uh, 30, 30 by 96 greenhouse. This is on the same day. <coughs> Pretty darn cold outside and lots of snow and inside we're planting transplants. They have 114 degree water to work oh. with. <laughs> so I asked him, I said, well what are we going to do with that water? He says, let's put it under some of the beds. Yeah. So we put it under the beds and under the walkway and we can turn them off and on. So it's, you could use the water to control the climate pretty good. By late April, we're shutting them off. We don't even need them. Or it's really, really warm in there. Here's some of the pictures from inside there. And it's being managed regeneratively. So the first year it was a breeze. Second year we had some challenges with, not, not with pests, but with um, diseases the second year. The owner brought in tomatoes from an outside greenhouse and they had diseases and we didn't know it. We got them. But can be hugely successful and fantastic tasting food. 
I'm Joe Clark, I'm from Summers, and this is my greenhouse. It was built in 17 and 18, and uh, because I'm a videographer, I think the best thing to do is to show you a little video here. Welcome to my greenhouse. This is going to be the first in a series of videos about how I built this thing. We incorporated a shipping container in the construction and we also have some interesting underground systems for heating and cooling. This video is for you if you're just curious about greenhouses, if you're doing research to build one, or if you want to retrofit one using some of the systems that we have. So the first thing we should probably do is take a tour. Underneath the floor, we dug a hole that was 10 feet wide, 10 feet deep, and about 40 feet long. And we put 500 feet of perforated pipe plus 60 yards of oversized rock in that, and wove that pipe through that rock. And then we brought those pipes up in two places in the greenhouse. It creates a battery down there so we can use the climate of the ground, which is a pretty constant 50 degrees. And behind the shipping container, we buried underneath 200 yards of dirt, about 50 feet of pipe, and then we plumbed that into the greenhouse in two places to help with the cooling and the heating. This breezeway has proven to be a really good idea. It helps us regulate how much air is coming in and we're able to close off and open up the sunshine with those uh, French doors with the shades on. Also, you'll notice this is raised. That's because the greenhouse is built on grade and then we uh, we built up around it and that's proven to, to work really well. This is the west end of the greenhouse and as you can see we have the fan covered to keep the snow out in the winter time and also we have French doors on this end also gives us a lot of openness to, to let air in on a hot day. Up in the ridge, we have temperature actuated vents that open when it's about 70 degrees, and if it gets colder than that, it, it'll close them. That gives us convection of the air up through that and takes that hot air out of here. Each end of the shipping container has a room. One's a root cellar, one's a tool room, and we also start seeds in there. We have water and electricity coming into the greenhouse, so we have lights and plumbing. So why go through all the expense and uh, time and effort to, to build this thing? Um, what happened in my case is, is I had some real estate investments and I sold one, so I had some money. Well, I could have bought myself a new pickup or a boat or a car or something like that, but I decided to invest in something that, that was a little more practical for us. Uh, this build cost me about $15,000, but I did all the work and I had the shipping container. We had uh, hundreds of trips to uh, the restore, so I kept the expenses down as, as much as I could. The three main reasons that I built this greenhouse was food sovereignty, lifestyle, and to grow food year round. That's my great grandson, he, he likes what we grow. But uh, food sovereignty is the right to choose what food to eat, where it comes from, and how it's grown. Rather than have to rely for myself, I didn't want to have to rely on uh, poison food to eat. And to know your farmer, you know your food. And I think that the, the boils down to the best thing you can do is grow your own food. At least some of it. Even if you only have a size as big as this table, you can grow year-round outside. If you, if you know what you're doing. There's some really good videos on uh, my YouTube channel. Uh, one of them is uh, Winter Harvest by L.A. Coleman. And I highly recommend you watch that one. It's really, really good. And you know, we're all headed for this, right? This is my friend. 
and you'll get there faster and more painful if you, if, you know, if you if you don't take care of your body. It was a really a, a big shocker for me to find out that there was 70 crops that are FDA approved to be desiccated. You know, I, this is one thing here. Uh, this guy is spraying uh, be, in the middle uh, with some Roundup, but that crop of chickpeas, when it got uh, mature, they came in and sprayed it round up again and just decimated it. Um, what that means is, and potatoes, they do the same thing with potatoes now, they're using uh, 2,4-D and still and uh, glyphosates and they're spraying those things and uh, that stuff just goes into the food system. I mean, it's one thing to spray the weeds when before the plants come up, but another to desiccate. So that kind of got my attention. Uh, I didn't want to be eating bread that had glyphosates in it, uh, peas, and you know the, you can look up at mine and see those 70 crops. So the other thing that motivated me was uh, lifestyle. I'm like Michael. I like to go out in the greenhouse and, and do my thing, and kind of commune with the the, uh, the plants and play with my grandkids. I have five of those and two great grandkids. I don't look at it, do I? I'm actually 170. <laughs> but you can see these pictures. I mean, we had a good time growing it and are building that greenhouse, and we have a good time with this kind of a lifestyle also. Kids are always coming over and playing and helping me plant and harvest. And I wanted to grow food all around, uh, year round. And again, that, that same motivation was true. I wanted to control where my food was coming from. And, uh, you know, this last year we had a really um, wild month in September, October, it got really cold, so I just let the greenhouse go so I didn't grow much. So we were going to Costco and buying uh, vegetables and stuff, and they always come in just plastic containers. God, it was something different, you know, so I'm motivated about um, not letting that happen again. Inside of my greenhouse, uh, one thing that I do, uh, much like Elliot Coleman does outside too, is, is I have zones inside of my greenhouse. Now I can take that climate battery and run air in and out of those zones themselves, so I don't have to. I don't have to grow in the whole greenhouse. I can just take pick little zones, and I can even put a little heater in there if I want to. Here's another one looking into the shipping container, and we have those heat sink barrels there. But I just drop that curtain at night and it, it's fine. It also has some fruit trees, that's a peach tree. There's a couple of them couple of them in there and this was in the springtime. By fall we had peaches on there. This was some cover crops and other stuff we were growing but it's uh, really fertile. I also own Genesis biochar and this is what happens when you put biochar in the ground. I mentioned that those uh, planters are self-watering too. We built them up and then we have a uh, four inch pipe in the bottom perforated pipe with, with uh, socks on and a float. So uh, it always keeps that, that four inches full of water and it's down about 14 inches and so the, the roots are going after that all the time. The only time I water on top of that is when I have seedlings. Looks yummy, doesn't it? It becomes a forest if you, if you don't pay attention. <laughs> it becomes a forest. And uh, one thing about my design is I use the waterfall front and we have no shadows in there at all. It diffuses that, that light. We use a double uh, plastic covering with a fan in it. And with this kind of a, a uh, structure, it, it bubbles up. I have about a foot and a half airspace in the top of it. It works really well. So things I would do differently next time, I'd put additional geothermal pipes in the excavation trenches and I'd make I wouldn't do the tire uh, retaining wall, it was too uh, time consuming, I didn't like the way it looked. And uh, I'd separate the climate battery into multiple zones and I'd flip the shipping container upside down. This is the hundred and some feet of trenches I dug for my water system. And I had about a hundred feet of electrical trenches also. Well I could have put geothermal pipes in that also because it's below the frost line. And in the, the electrical line, it wouldn't matter in the summer, I could use that to help cool the greenhouse because that's just as hard as heating it, keeping it cool. So uh, the reason I, I really want to stress that is because you know, if you decide to, to 
build a greenhouse, uh, you know, check out all the resources you have. You know, do you have somebody that's growing, or do you have availability to manure, fresh manure? You can make a coil and pile it on there and that'll create heat and you can use that in your greenhouse. Just, there's lots of resources if you stop and think about it and look around. And I miss this one. <laughs> so, um, you know, if you're building a new house and you're gonna have a greenhouse, put some geothermal in there with your, your um, water system. And there's that tires. <coughs> you can see I would have had a lot of uh, room underneath that to, to put uh, pipe, other geothermal pipes I didn't. I just put that one um, earth tube in there. This is the hole where we put the pipes. I could have put probably two more layers of pipes in there. What I have now, what I have now works, <coughs> but it would work a lot better if I had more air movement. So right now I'm actually doing this with a shovel in the end of the greenhouse inside of it. I'm digging a hole that's you know, clear across all the way down at about six feet or eight feet deep. And I'm taking that and I'm gonna put more, hook into more fans inside that, that geothermal system that I have. And uh, yeah, you can see I, I would, have, would have had more room to put that stuff in there. There's 500 feet of pipe in there. I could have easily had 1,000 feet which would have been about uh, one, one foot for each square foot of my greenhouse. Uh, I would have flipped the, the uh, shipping container upside down. You can see how that shored up. We'll, we'll have some questions in a minute. See how that shored up? That's sort of like a, a mine. Well, that's because shipping containers are just thin in the, in the top. I could have flipped that upside down and plated it. I just didn't have the money and, and I didn't have the patience to wait for the money. So I did it this way. So I can put about eight inches of dirt on there and you can see it's sagging a little bit on there, even at that. But I could have put four foot on there if I'd have flipped it upside down. There's howtofarmandgarden.com. We have about, um, we have over 130 hours of videos on there now, including free to see videos. And that's, that's mine. Okay. <laughs> Somebody asked me earlier, uh, you know, do they expect us to to build these things? And that's not why we're here. We're just trying to give you ideas and inspire you um, and show you what we've done. So if anybody has any questions. Question for you. What dimension uh, do you use? I use five inch perforated with oversized rock. And how many square feet is your green house? It's about 1,100 square feet. But I don't think that was enough, really, for year round. For se shoulder seasons, it's okay, but when it gets down 10 degrees or below, it's, it's pretty tough, unless I'm throwing just in the zone, so then it's fine. So with just the fan, how, what temperature, when it gets like really cold, 20 below or whatever? Well, it depends on where I put it. Um, I guess I don't know. Yeah, there's different temperatures in different parts of the greenhouse. So. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is that when it gets that low, the, the climate battery isn't enough. Right. So I'd have to supplement the heat. I don't want to do that. I don't want to spend the money on that. Um, I could get some kind of a wood burning situation like what he has, or I could put an outside boiler with wood or use gas or whatever. You know, that's an individual decision. So, I mean, ours, it gets. Um, when it's 20 below, it'll be, if I don't do anything, it'll get down to about 28 in the greenhouse. But, so it still freezes and it's just totally frosty in there. Um, which is great if you're doing certain things, you know. But, uh, I just wanted to, to try and do the year round thing as opposed, and, and I don't even know, I haven't gotten there yet, so I don't know yeah. how it's going Well, the big thing there. is sunlight. You know, if, if we, we don't live, have enough light, yeah. if I could get more sun, it would heat. Like a day, like you know, if the sun comes out, it'll get up to seventy out there yeah. pretty quickly. There's Even at the zones, you can put lights in. Yeah. But you know, lettuce and brassicas and stuff—they only need six hours of sunlight. So you can grow. You can even grow out underneath the snow if you want to build something to keep the snow off of it and the frost off of it. You can actually grow year-round there. It just grows really slow. We got a question. Remember, how do you keep the snow load off? All of you. What do you do about snow? I mean, we can get a lot of snow. Yeah, I've had this much snow on top. Yeah, of do you not worry about it then? I mean, do your ropes hold that and everything? Yeah, it's it's. I I think you can hold the snow. 
mine comes off and just builds up against the front. It just slides off. Yeah. And mine comes out as soon as the sun comes out, it slides right off. Okay. So my south slope doesn't hold any. It would have been on mine. I have a very low pitch, so it does hold the snow, which is not the greatest. But yeah, I noticed it was also, yeah. you know, I was dealing with the constraints of the subdivision and heights, and you know, my neighbors. We have a half acre, so it's not. Like Other than brassicas and kale, what else are you growing that allows you to make the longest possible season or maybe get through the winter? Okay, I can answer some of it. What I do is I, I plant everything in succession. <clears throat> like, uh, I've already planted my uh, potatoes and carrots and stuff like that, and I have all my starts and everything made in January for the greenhouse. And some of that I'll move out in the, in, to the garden later. But in the fall, I'll, I'll, I'll grow stuff uh, in August for what's going to happen in the winter. Because, you know, it, can, it doesn't hurt them to freeze. So you just go out and, and, and uh, harvest. Are you using lights to get those stuff you start in January to get it going? Uh, I I seed them in the house, but I I've done it in in the seed room in the greenhouse. And I use lights in that, but found it was easier just to you know sit and have my coffee at, at the table and watch them grow there, and then I move them out into the zone. That that picture, the one with, over the planter box, that's been there for about a month now inside. And Elliot Coleman's book, um, Four Season Gardening, and his videos too, will help you kind of learn some of the plant succession and what what will work and what won't. He's in Vermont, so pretty yeah. in That video we have on how to farm a garden is a really, really, really good presentation. Um, because it's so overcast here in the winter, does that thermal mass along your back wall, the water, does that work in the winter or? Are you asking me? Yeah, because you have yeah. that wall of yeah. water, right? And, and to understand how that works is that uh, cold air sucks the heat out of things, right? So during the day, those water barrels and all that thermal mass like his, that all absorbs heat and it holds it and then, it, then it'll, it'll pull it out as during the night. So that's how that works. And, and there's no perfect answer for that. That's why adding things, and there's no one system. You have to have lots of small well, systems. Oh, okay. So and it's not like the sunlight hitting the back wall, hitting it. It's just the It is. Kind of, so there's, okay. there, there's multiple things going on. So the sunlight is one thing, but and the sunlight does heat the water in the thermal mass. And then the, the thermal mass discharges it slowly. As, um, but if you get, have like weeks of overcast, then you're not going to get any recharge from that. The, the soil, you know, you do have the temperature down low, below the frost line, is going to be very consistent. Um, it's kind of like the root cellar. I mean, it stays at 39 degrees all the time. And that's just like being under the ground. Um, but the air coming out of my, the air coming out of my uh, uh, climate battery it, in the winter time, if it if I run it a lot in the summer to cool, it'll go up to about sixty degrees. And it stays there with all that rock. It stays there all on there. And is that like six feet down or the top of below, it? The top what? of it is at five feet. The other thing with the climate battery is that, like, when we do get a sunny day, like I have a, a it's like an attic fan thermo <coughs> uh, thermostat. So when it gets up to like right now, I have it set at seventy degrees. If I get to seventy instead of having an open event on the roof and let that heat out, it turns a little fan on and it blows it down into that rock. So it stores it in the floor for um, use later. Um, and, and then it cools the greenhouse too, the space. So you're taking the heat and just dumping it underneath. Um, and it's just a fan. So you still have to, it's a mechanical thing that you have to use electricity for, but it's not a lot. Yes. And so we do so um, Lessons with science in there. And then the, we have plants with tomatoes that are probably 10, 12 foot tall in there in the growing season. And so they're in there all the way up till November, in late November. Kids still harvest some tomatoes and stuff in there. So the big thing with the kids is, is to get them to eat the food and the hands-on interaction to be able to know the, even how stuff grow and what. So I always try to plant things that will throw throw them some loops and so we had transplanted carrots this year 
I was thinking, I have got this cure thing figured out. I will just plant them in the greenhouse in plugs and we'll transplant them from wherever we want them. So we could have purple ones here, yellow ones there, orange ones there. So make it fun for the kids, you know. So the very first kid that pulled the uh, carrot out, I was like, what in the world? The roots were like, hey, snarly <laughs> everywhere. And I'm like, hmm. <laughs> the next one, snarly and crazy. And I'm like, every single one of them was snarly and crazy. The kids were like, yay, what is it? <laughs> I'm like, well, it is a it's wild a carrot. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> But actually, those carrots produce probably five times more pounds than the traditional one-rooted carrot would have produced because of the the stress that are, or the the reaction of that transplant to that taproot. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, anything that you could get kids excited about and stuff makes a lot fun. As a follow-up, when you say it's important to get them to eat the food, is that something where they take the tomatoes home and their parents cook it with them or yep. are you combining it into the school foods? The, the panel we talked about this afternoon will get into that but we we are picking it right on site and we take it right to the cafeteria the cafeteria washes it and right in the salad bar. Uh -huh. So like for instance cherry tomatoes if we do it the first two hours of the day they're going to be in the lunch that day. Uh, if not they will be in the lunch the next day on the salad bar. We try to do that on Monday Right, so then we have salvar all week because we're a four-day school with system. So by Friday, they're like they're tearing it down and starting over. So we don't want to bring stuff in there on Thursday that they're going to throw out. So just different things that we do in that tactic. Uh, you can't stop them from eating them out of the <laughs> soil and all. So yeah, especially in the Yeah. Um, with the double plastic covers, are you going to have to replace that in? Years. Yeah, I expect it to last six years, but what I'm, what I'm hoping is that I'll be able to take the, the inside layer and replace it and use the inside layer on the outside. And it wasn't that expensive. It was 550 or something like that with all the wiggle wire and everything. It wasn't very expensive. You no, know, it was very quick to install. Yeah, it was very easy. Slave labor. Good <laughs> <laughs> okay, question? Oh, no, um, one thing I would like to share uh, since we have a little bit of time is that uh, going back to, to growing your own food um, you know if you just if you were just eating food and you didn't have your stomach you couldn't do anything with your food right so if that that bio uh, uh, bioorganisms that are in your gut if, if they're if that's not working right you're not going to be healthy right and you you need to uh, uh, take care of that and not allow poisons to go in it so there's only one cell of, of uh, tissue between your stomach and your immune system so you've heard of leaky gut I don't know if you've heard of that it's somebody in the news has had it too that's what causes that is, is contaminations and so uh, we know that we rely on our gut to digest our food. Well, it's interesting also is that there is a uh, symbiotic relationship between the plant and what's going on in the soil. You can't just go plant a plant on a rock and expect it to grow. It has to have a microorganism community in there taking that's that's helping that to uh, uptake to chelate the the uh, uh, nutrients into the plants. I know you're you're probably a lot more up to speed on that than I am, but. Uh, think very carefully if you're going to grow things about the soil and take care of that soil because it's the, the plant's stomach and its nervous system. So that has that needs to be healthy. Don't you know, I would recommend you don't go out there just because you see a bug and, sp and spray it with something. You know, find alternative uh, uh, beneficials or cheap. You can get them uh, online and they just send them to you. Put them in there and you know within a week or so all the bad bugs are gone. Uh, have a frog in your greenhouse, that's helpful. Uh, I'd have a snake, but my wife won't allow it. <laughs> but anyway, they're, they're, uh, when you start to study that, and even even how the electrons move within the soil, uh, it's, 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 it is amazing how much communication is going on in there. And I found that actually more fascinating than watching the plants grow, is, is trying to figure out what's going on underneath the ground with 
and it's fun to experiment with that stuff. And in a greenhouse, you have a really uh, somewhat controlled environment where you can, you know, if you like to do sciencey stuff, you can you can study that and, and participate in, in different, uh, you know, how does how does how does this one kind of a plant react to different things? And it's just a lot of fun. So don't eat poison food. <laughs> that was actually a huge part of the motivation for me was that my wife and I had a lot of health issues that we were dealing with and kind of feeling like we were falling apart and way too early and um, wanted to feel better. And so we, we did in all of our research and found out about using glyphosate as a desiccant on crops and all the chemicals that are used in traditional <coughs> agriculture and it was just like oh, we got it by organic and it's like and so one thing led to another and that's it was, it was a big motivating force and it's amazing how the snakes just come because we had tons of snakes <laughs> <laughs> <Can I borrow? laughs> they're all over the yard and uh, I don't know it's it's but they're like garter snakes they're not bad we yeah. don't have rattlesnakes. Even anymore. in the school garden, we've got enough diversity and enough things going on that we'll have leopard frogs and we'll Red have gardener yeah. snakes and, and insects where the, if your science people and kids would get involved, that they would be identifying for years that that I don't know what they are. You know, they're so tiny that I'm like, I need a microscope to figure out who's who, just in the insect world. Right, and they're not hurting anything. They're all kind of working together. So to single out and say, I have a pest, you might think you have a pest, but you actually have a food source or a place for somebody else to raise a baby when you thought it was a pest. So maybe if you think you have a pest, go on vacation. Take a break. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do anything about it, you know. If you have diversity of plants in your garden, the nature's gonna take care of that for you. So don't worry about the past. Yeah, if you plant enough stuff, there's always something else to eat, right? <laughs> and, yeah. And, yeah, and we really need to learn how to share. And that plant that had to work super hard, say it's a broccoli, and it's got attacked by cabbage moss, and it's got holes everywhere. It I bring people be. in the greenhouse, and they're like, wow, you got the holiest broccoli I've ever seen. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> and I'm like, that plant has got way more nutrition in it and can be get defoliated up to 40% and still be healthier than the plant that I kept here. Because it worked and it made chemicals and it it becomes stronger and healthier fighting off the enemy. It's like think about the kids in school, the ones that gotta do a little elbow pushing and get along and figure out I gotta hold my ground. That kid's gonna be stronger than the kid that had, had it easy peasy his whole life. The plants are the same way. So those plants are more nutritious. So when you go to the farmer's market, I go to the Billings farmer's market, there's very few organics there. And I will go through the whole thing to look for the organic food. And when the lady's got the cabbage with the holes in it, I will buy that one. That's the one I want. That's the most nutrition. It's the healthiest for me. That's a so challenge to get over. If more people would think that stop buying with their eyes, we don't eat with our eyes, right? Those tomatoes that taste like cardboard, they're, wor <laughs> they're worthless. You want the ones that taste really good. Okay. We've got five minutes if any anybody wants questions? any other questions. Does anybody here have a greenhouse? A yeah, there was a lot of them. Yeah. Cool. Anything you guys want to share about yours? I, like, I have a little free span being spent a fortune on it. And it's a great old thing. I was expecting wonderful things, but I'm from Wyoming, moved here in the clouds. I thought clouds. it was going to happen, and it didn't. So I guess you just extend the season is all you can really do with something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, start early. Yeah, because right now I have charred growing in there. Yep. One thing I noticed, though, in the greenhouse, um, when we got the frost, you know, and it dropped right down to 20 degrees in the passive solar greenhouse at the school, and go in there, the spinach is still happy, the kale's happy as could be, and of course your tomatoes and peppers are whacked, but the others are happy as could be and have no pro no even signs of cold, right? Because there's no wind in there. There actually isn't frost falling. And so they they went through it with no problem at all and probably made them stronger even. <coughs> yes. 
I've uh, made my tomatoes last longer by putting frost fabric over them. I have a 12 by 48 mm -hmm. food greenhouse. And they'll actually survive as long as you get them covered. They'll, yep. they'll go through those lighter frost. You know? Yeah. Yeah, because you gain some temperature just having the hoop, but right. when it starts getting down to freezing, they're area, covering you know, inside yeah. the greenhouse. Yeah, yeah, just with the frost fabric, though. They have your stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and I've managed to get things riper that yeah, way without fantastic. having to haul them in and right. ripen them in the house. Yeah. And they don't ever taste as good. They don't yeah. taste quite the same. No, that's why I try to. Yeah. Yeah. And Elliot's Coleman book does a lot of that where they got double layers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Um, I got, moved here from Southern Oregon. And this was just like an idea that I got from someone else. But I, I would cover my uh, bell peppers and tomatoes, you know, towards the end of the season, extend them just out in the garden, garden bed. <coughs> and one year I tried to decide that somebody, this uh, fellow, actually it was gardening, uh, the US, uh, research extension, and he was doing a thing on, we were both on the, the local TV program and answering questions. and. He is recommended using like old fashioned Christmas lights, you know, hanging them in your tree for a little frost protection in the spring. Mm. Well, I decided to try that. I laid it down in my pepper bed. And I, you know, before it's, it usually would uh, start turning cold, like October and frost, about the end of October somewhere. Um, so I, before I covered it up, I finished up, pinched off all the blossoms and all the smaller peppers, so I concentrate on the ones I had. I put the lights in there, and then I couldn't open it up again for almost a month and a half because it was so cold and wet that I did, if I opened it up, I would really chill everything. I opened it up, and I had like ripe bell peppers, wow. <laughs> and everything that I left had got you know had grown out in size, and it la this lasted about a month and a half longer than usual. And I was just amazed. I haven't had a chance to replicate that because that was a little longer for so much place, but. Yeah, I was just really, you know, it was like really just a little bit more um, heat from the lights, and they weren't even all white lights. They were just colored lights. Um, but it just made an amazing difference. And it might even be better for the plants because they had a different spectrum. And talking about out of season things, we had a low tunnel, so it was just a single hoop with a single plastic cover on it. And we had planted spinach in the fall. They can, I don't know, I think we plan on August or September thinking, oh, we'll get some right, you know, because they're only, what, 45 days. Well, that's not true in the fall. So it gets longer and longer. But so I had some kids out in the garden, and there was snow on the, gr on the ground still, and it was spring, and it was probably March. And we pulled, I said, let's look in here, see what's in here. We pulled the plastic off, and it's just a carpet of green, a spinach, six yeah. inches tall, and they're like, oh, and they just started grazing, you know. So. <laughs> Fantastic. So a little bit of cover can do all kinds of things. So. I know one of you hit on it, that greenhouse in the snow of an alliance. Just to throw in another pitch for that because it's mind-blowing amazing. This guy is talking about, he's trying to promote like greenhouses in the, in the, on the Oval Aquifer, like the Sand Hills of Nebraska on an industrial scale for citrus production where, you know, the problems in California and Florida blight and all that, where they have none of that there. And their winters get cold and windy, but burying it down in there. And for 30 years, he's been doing this, and he was trying to give it away for free. This knowledge, trying to tell everybody in the world about it. He, you know, you get someone you get a brilliant idea, you can't give away for free. But now that he's charging money for it, yeah, yeah. it's flying out the door, and it's <laughs> everywhere. But he's he's old and got rage. But not yeah. a lot of time left. But it's yeah. amazing what he's doing. Yeah, and Russ is uh, he's got this greenhouse has been in for 30 years, but he's yeah. he's been improving the model for 30 years for all these other growers and stuff. And so the size of pipe, the amount of footage and all yeah. of that stuff and the size of fan and where the fan location is, he's got all that down. And when you talk so about the, the cost of building it mm -hmm. versus the output and the revenue right. from high value crops like citrus, it's right. pretty yeah. amazing. Well, yeah. and and especially in, in an area where you get some sunshine too, yeah. because then it'll heat the sun. It just heats and things so Plus fast. Plus it's set up like a passive solar. You know, yeah. it's narrow and long. Right. This was 96 right. foot long. It's a lot of greenhouses. Yeah. Well, do you know if he has to add any extra heat in the wintertime to keep that Alliance, no. no. His house is attached to the far end okay. of that greenhouse. Mm -hmm. And so, no, he's not adding extra. But the, but even the citrus have got to get down to like 30 yeah. degrees or so for so many days. Okay. So he monitors that. But uh, yeah. he wouldn't be able to do anything about it. Yeah. I mean, you know, he's either got the fan on or off or it's pulling or pushing. Yes. Would it be worthwhile replicating that in 
here. Yes, definitely. He's got some in Panhandle, Idaho. Oh, okay. And so, yeah, that's definitely. With possible different results, they've got more sun than whatever we do. Yeah. But you can get two on one semi, so work together. <laughs> and get two of them up here. And even if we can grow for uh, 10 months, yeah. and maybe not grow citrus, but if we're growing grapes and mm -hmm. yeah. all that, why not? Try it. You can put 20,000 in the heat on a regular greenhouse in a couple of years. Yeah. We're so, out of time. Yep, we are. All right. Thank, Thank you. you.